Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. What was the sin that plagued the children of Israel throughout its history? The answer, according to the Bible, is idolatry. Now, we might think today in our modern societies, with understanding technology and science, being full of higher education, that such a sin, idolatry, is only for the uncivilized, the uneducated, those who lack wisdom. But nothing could be further from the truth. Because when we look at idolatry, there are two primary characteristics. The first is a desire to be like others, to assimilate. And today, psychiatrists would tell us that one of the guiding influences of our society is peer pressure. People want the things that other people have. They want to be like, they want to imitate. So assimilation, peer pressure, that desire to be like is still very much a problem today. And secondly, idolatry is all about you accomplishing your desires, what you want, what you are ambitious for, rather than being subjected to the will, the purposes of God. When we examine society, all societies today, idolatry is still very much a plague for the people. Take out your Bible and look with me to the prophecy of Isaiah and chapter 28. The prophecy of Isaiah and chapter 28. Now, here in the first half that we're going to learn in this lesson, we're going to see that God through Isaiah is speaking to the northern kingdom, what is commonly referred to as Israel. Remember that after King Solomon that nation of Israel was divided into two kingdoms, the northern one called Israel and the southern one called Judah. And Israel was characterized, this northern kingdom was characterized by idolatry. And that spread, as we'll find out later on, to the southern kingdom. But for this study, we're going to limit our discussion to that northern kingdom called Israel. But it was also known as by another name, and that is Ephraim, the, the child of preference of Joseph, the one who received that special blessing from his grandfather, Yaakov. And therefore, and this is very significant, Prophetically, when that northern kingdom is spoken to frequently, it's called by that term Ephraim. Now, Ephraim means fruitful. God had blessed that northern kingdom in the sense the land was a good land, a rich land, a fertile land. They had much wealth, but nevertheless, instead of being fruitful in the things of God, that which would be pleasing to him. They turned aside. They had that same worldly ambition as the nations. And they were not a godly people, but one, as we'll see, ruled by their own desires, a prideful people. Look with me to verse 1. It begins with a very significant Hebrew word, the word hoi, which speaks about a warning of coming, 
and imminent destruction. God is going to bring destruction on that northern kingdom. Ephraim will not be fruitful in the days of Isaiah. But Ephraim will cease to exist. Her future because of pride, because of idolatry, because of assimilation, because of a desire to achieve what, what they wanted. Because of these things, the punishment, the destruction was coming to this kingdom. So we read here, woe and the implication is woe to and notice the first description of the people we see the phrase a terit geut which is a crown of pride now if you do good word studies this word geut oftentimes means majesty and it can have a positive connotation but in this setting Within this context, it speaks about a self-majesty, that which one pursues to glorify not God, but one owns life. And therefore, Ephraim is called this crown of pride. And the next description is the drunkards of Ephraim. Now, primarily, although Everyone in that kingdom is going to suffer. In many ways, this prophecy is aimed at those with influence. And I'm speaking about leaders, those that were in charge of this nation. And notice that they're spoken of here as drunkards. They were under, in other words, a wrong influence. Not the spirit of God, not the truth of God, not the word of God, but rather the things that are synonymous with the ways of the world. So God warns them and speaks judgment by calling them drunkards of Ephraim and that they are a fading flower. And, and the beauty of splendor and this northern kingdom had much beauty. As we're going to see, it was a very good land. It had a tremendous potential and used all of their resources for the wrong things. So we read that it's splendor of beauty, which is upon the head, meaning it was very visible. People knew of this northern kingdom, splendor, glory, beauty. They wore it, we would say, on the sleeve in a public manner. And it says the valley of, and the word here means oil, but it speaks of the fertile valley. Once again, God gave this nation much in the way of resources. It had a great potential. But notice how. Verse 1 ends, although this nation had great potential, it was struck down. It was overwhelmed with wine. And here, wine, as we see so often in the scripture, is related to joy, happiness. And here's the problem. It pursued simply a fleshly joy. It wanted to gratify itself. It used everything that God gave. It misappropriated these things for their own pleasure rather than the pleasure of God. Verse 2, they forgot something. They forgot the majesty of God because they were focusing in on their own earthly majesty. They forgot the power of God. Look at verse 2. Behold, strong and and this word can mean strong as well, but also courageous. It speaks not just of a, a physical power, but also an inward, a fortitude, a, a commitment to that which is right. So God is being spoken of here, and he is said to be strong and, and powerful is the Lord. He is like, keep reading, 
a current, and this might mean a storm. But it's the same word that speaks about a powerful river to flow, that strong current. But here we have the word for hail. Hail is destruction. And God is going to bring a storm of destruction, a, a storm of hail, and it is going to be a storm of destruction as the currents of strong waters that, that sweep away. And he says, he will lay the land flat in his hand under his authority. Now, the term here for hand does indeed speak about God's authority. We are reminded in the exodus from Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. It speaks about a manifestation of God's power, his authority in all places. And here God is going to show his authority, his strength, his might in judgment. And in the same way that when floodwaters come and sweep things away, and there's nothing that humanity can do, these strong waters bring swift destruction. This is what the hand of God, the power of God, the authority of God is going to bring. Verse 3. At his feet, and that's the implication, it simply says, with feet, but it's a reference to, in a poetic manner, the feet of God will trample down the, the crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim, verse 4. And it will be the fading flower and the splendor of his beauty, which is upon his head, meaning very visible. This, this valley that was fertile or rich, and it's a word for oil, but oil has to do with that which is of the goodness, the fatness of the land. It all says that God is going to do something. He is going to bring swift destruction, and notice how he speaks of it. As the first fruits before the summer. So people are waiting for that initial harvest. It's something to look forward to. And therefore, the first fruits before the summer, which one sees, he sees it. And while still in his hand, he swallows it up. Meaning, he is so excited about the fruit that instead of harvesting it, the first thing he does is that he tastes it and devours it with this an anticipation. Now, this is poetic language to say that God's judgment is going to come quickly. It is going to come fast and it is going to swallow up what the people have built up. Why? Because God is not pleased with the results. Now, prophecy, we always need to make personal. We need to ask ourselves, is God pleased with our results? What we're achieving, what we're committed to, the things that we're about? Or are those things that our life is committed to, is this going to be the source of God's judgment and going to be the location of his destruction? So it's always a call to self Examine self and to see if God is, is pleased. Verse 5. Notice that familiar term of judgment. On that day, the Lord of hosts will be a glorious crown and a diadem of splendor for the remnant of his people, those that remain. Now, this speaks about the faithfulness of God, that God consistently preserves a remnant. Those who are not swept away by society, that stand in a different place, that, that, is, that are committed to 
a different purpose. And therefore, God is going to be, notice the terminology in verse 5, he is going to be a glorious crown and a diadem, meaning that that ruling crown is going to be one of splendor, that he is going to manifest to only a remnant of his people. And, and how is he going to do this? How is one going to be set apart as a remnant? Well, notice what verse 6 says. And for a spirit of judgment for the one who sits concerning judgment. Now, this is the one who has taken his stand. He is, is in a location for a purpose. And that purpose is to execute justice. He is concerned about that which is right. So he does not go along with society. He does not flow with the rest. But the remnant is going to be one that is motivated about justice from a godly standpoint. So God, for that remnant, is going to be a spirit of justice for the one who sits concerning justice. And he is going to be mighty, and look at this, for the ones who restore or turn back war at the gate. And what this is is an idiom. Gate is a place for judgment. It is a place where justice is administered. So the ones who restore justice, they are going to be fighting they're going to be the ones who are contending at the gate in order to establish justice. There's going to be, in the terminology here, war. So it's not speaking so much from those who return from the battle, but rather those who restore justice at the gate and do so in a very intense battle. Verse 7. It says, also these, and it's speaking about the current leadership. It says, also these with wine, they were, were led astray, they erred. And with strong drink, they were led astray. And who are we speaking about? The priest and the prophets. They erred with strong drink. And they were swallowed up from wine. Now, here again, what it's saying is that they had the wrong perspective. They were seeking simply gratification. They were under the wrong influence. So wrong influence, strong drink. Wrong objective, wine. And when we are pursuing that which is not proper, when we are under the influence that's not the Holy Spirit, we're going to find that we are going to experience God's judgment. We are going to be led astray. We are going to perform errors, and the end result is judgment. We read on that they were led astray by the wrong influence, by strong drink. They erred. In their vision, they saw things incorrectly and they tottered, meaning they did not remain strong in. And the word here is, in modern Hebrew, it's a word for a criminal code. It relates to making a right decision that affirms the law. And what we find here is that they staggered, they, they toppled in this, this justice system. It was not something that related to the truth of God. Verse 8. For all the tables, and these tables would be the place where the administrators, the justices, the judges would sit and they would give out their verdict. And notice the, the imagery here, the, the language for all the tables were full of vomit, and the word here is manure, 
without a place, meaning there was no clean place that was not stained, corrupted, and the language is, is most revolting, revolting, vomit, and extremement. Verse 9. Who will teach knowledge? And who will understand the report? And this is what God would say, what they hear from the Lord. And notice who it is. It's, it's not those who have lived a long time, who are old and presumably wise, but quite the contrary. Isaiah is going to give us description of very young people, children, not uh, toddlers, but a little older than that. Those who, and notice the language, it says, who will teach knowledge and who will understand the report, meaning the report of the Lord? Those who have been weaned from, from milk and those that, that have, have graduated from the breast, meaning no longer being nursed. Now, the teaching here is this. It's those that are young that they have not been influenced significantly by society. That they're still young enough and the implication would be in our language still innocent enough. That have not matured and become part of society. So it's speaking about, it's a reference to a very important concept and that is that next generation. So those that are not infants, are not small toddlers, but have graduated a little bit past that. They're very young children. Perhaps four, five, six have not been influenced greatly by society. They can be taught. So God is putting his, his, his plans for that next generation to bring about a change. Verse 10. Now, we're going to see this verse appear twice in, in the next passage. And if we translate it literally, it's kind of odd. Let's do that, and then we'll talk about it. Verse 10, for commandment to commandment, commandment to commandment, line to line, line to line, a little there, a little there. Now, what it's speaking about here is a very simplistic way of understanding something. Not looking at the whole structure, but taking something piece by piece. Building something, a commandment after a commandment. And then we have the word tav, which is a word for line. And frequently in the Bible, it's a measuring line. Now, what it speaks about is building something very slowly, one step at a time. So God is speaking about this youth, these very young people, and he is going to move, he is going to, to continue with his purposes, with his plans, with his objectives, and he's going to do so with young people and teaching them things little by little, one step at a time. Those are the ones who he is going to use that can follow his simple instructions. Look at verse 11. In regard to the adults, the so-called enlightened ones, those who are rulers of society, says, for with a mocking lip and in a different speech, he will speak to this people, meaning that this simple instruction is going to be seen by, by society. They're not going to put any value in that. For them, God's simple instruction is going to be like a different tongue, a foreign language. He is not going to, because of their mindset, they're not going to be ones who receive the instructions of God. And today we see something very similar. There are people in leadership 
within the so-called believing community. I say that because I'm not so sure they're believers. And when they approach the scripture, they scoff at it. They reject it because of its simplicity. They think, well, you know, we are so wise today. We are so educated. We are enlightened. And we can't really believe a, a story like a six-day account of creation. We can't believe a, a flood and, and a man being swallowed up by a great fish. We, we don't believe those things as an enlightened society. That's the same falsehood and the same error that these individuals made some, some 2,800 years ago. So the word of God, they're going to mock, they're going to see as a foreign language. Verse 12. Who he said unto them, God is speaking unto them. This is rest that, that they lay before the weary. This is the, the relaxing. Now, what God is speaking about in these two words, he's saying that, that remember Messiah, who said, my, my yoke is light and my burden is easy? Well, he's speaking here about an invitation to him. And these people, once again, they mock that. They do not respond. They do not give to the people what, what God wants them to have. And they will not, he says, they do not want to hear. They don't want the truth, the simple truth from the Lord. Verse 13. And it shall come about to them the word of the Lord, nevertheless. And what it is, it's that same statement. A commandment to a commandment, a commandment to a commandment, a line to a line, a line to a line, a little there and a little there, which probably means a little here and a little there in our estimation. God gives them simple truth, but because they do not take hold of it, what happens? They go, they go and they stumble backwards. They are broken. They are captured. Literally, they are seized, and they are taken. What is this all a reference to? When we look at the last part, look carefully at verse 13. God gives them the truth, the simple message, how he wants them to respond. And they reject it, and they go their way, which leads to a fall, a stumbling. They don't go forward, they go backwards. They're broken, they're seized, and they're captured. Most scholars see the end of this verse, this rejection of God's instruction as a, a leading to exile. The northern tribes being seized and captured and taken into exile. Verse 14. Therefore, and here he's, he's speaking. He's speaking, and we need to pay heed to this. Verse 14, Therefore listen to the word of the Lord, O men of scoffers, the ones who rule this people which are in Jerusalem. Now there's a change. He's been speaking about what has happened to the northern kingdom. This one that was ruled by ungodly leaders. Those who sought the gratification of their flesh. They were influenced by the nations. Wanting to be like them rather than being the treasured people. A peculiar people. A people set apart by the word of God and for the purposes of God. Because that northern kingdom rejected that. What we find is they were sent into exile. And now, beginning in verse, verse 14, we see here that all of this, Isaiah is saying, pay attention to what happened to your brothers, to those other tribes in the north. 
They're no longer. They are taken into exile. They have ceased to exist as a people, as a nation. And therefore, Isaiah warns those who are the rulers of the people of God who are in Jerusalem. Verse 15, our last verse. For you say, and this is the problem, those in Jerusalem are not trusting in God. They are not committed to the covenant of God. That's one that he gave to the people in order that they might know truth and apply truth to their life. What have they done? Well, they've seen, they've seen the enemy, Assyria. But the one who's going to come later on is Babylon. And instead of trusting in God, repenting, taking his words, what do they do? Notice what he says, verse 15. For you have said, we have made a covenant with death, and with Sheol we have made a contract. Now, he's saying their response to God's prophetic word of a coming judgment is not to humble themselves, not to repent, not to trust in the instructions of God, but what, does they, what did they do? They made a covenant with, with death and an agreement with Sheol, the place of dead. In regard to this punishment, we have the word shot. Shot is a whip, and it's an instrument of punishment. And what do they say about the punishment of God? Well, they say shot, shotef meaning that God's punishment is going to pass by. For it will pass by and it will not come unto us. That's what the false prophets are saying. That God's punishment will not touch Judah. They're trusting in the fact that their capital is Jerusalem. So they say the punishment will pass by, it will go through, and will not come unto us. But what does God say? God says, for, and here's the implication, for we have set a lie for our stronghold, our refuge. And a falsehood, we have hidden ourselves. So God's pointing out, no, what you have done is that you have taken a lie and you took that lie and you're taking confidence that that false prophecy of those false prophets in Jerusalem are going to preserve you, shelter you. This lie is a false refuge. And he says as well, this, this other word for lie, sheker, he says, it's not going to hide you. You think it is, but it's not. Now, we're going to conclude with that. A warning towards that northern kingdom of destruction. That what they have trusted in, the agreement, this false covenant, this false prophecy that they've embraced is not going to preserve them from the judgment of God. If they continue in that same way, they too, like the northern kingdom, are going to be no more. They are going to be seized and they are going to be taken into exile. Now, the question that a wise one would ask is if the methodology that the people are following is going to lead to destruction and to exile, what is the means of salvation? How can the people find deliverance? And that's exactly what Isaiah is going to speak of when we begin next week with the second part of chapter 28. Until then, may God bless you and shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. 
Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.